know how we overcome that. Like yep. that's, that's, that's something I don't have an answer to. But if you've got more women in tech, then it becomes a bigger problem that people take more notice of. But I was earning more money than most graduates. after. But is it all about money? Gun in itself can be dangerous or it can be protective. But if the person holding the gun has ill intent, your perception was how can this person really be a leader in technology when they're not technical and they- Tell me something, would, do you think AI would just make people smarter? Then you're going to end up with some really dangerous and scary outcomes. And so it's very, again, yeah, but you know, what do you do? Do you li do you box yourself and live in fear? That and stuff while I'm studying, and then there were all these guys going upstairs. Everyone will be in because but, you know, you would know the answer for the future. Yeah, but you know, I was grumpy with the kids, and he was just like, "We want Emma money. back. We yeah, want, we want Emma, Emma back. back." That would probably be my advice: keep an awareness of that. Don't push yourself because it's ultimately not worth it. In the end. But being on a podcast is, is fantastic, so I think you're doing better than a lot of people, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Emma! <laughs> Hello. Welcome to Brain Splat. Thank you. Um, I know we've met in a short time, and um, this is our second meeting, really. But I was really impressed by um, whatever you provided on uh, through the social media and whatever you're trying to achieve and your message to the market and how you try just to motivate uh, women in general in, in the tech industry. And that really, really impressed me. So um, we're going to start talking about that in down the track. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, let's start with who is Emma. Uh, where was Emma born, her family, the school, and we progress through it. Sure. Sure. All right. So I'll do a, we'll do it as quickly as possible, but like, obviously it's me and I'm a pretty good expert at myself and I can get into a bit of detail. So let's, let's try the high level version. Uh, so I was born in Adelaide uh, and went to school in Adelaide as well. When I was 10, my parents split up and um, my mum met uh, my stepdad who was in technology. And um, also during that time, my grandma is a high school teacher and uh, what they identified was that I, with school and maths and all this stuff, I was loving it and everything, but they decided to skip me a year in school and go to high school one year early. So I went to high school one year early, then we moved house and we had to move high schools again. And then I went to this high school that let's just say it wasn't the best high school on the planet. And I got into some not so great stuff and um, we decided to go for scholarships. And so I went for a scholarship and got a scholarship at one of the girls' schools in Adelaide, which was really strong in maths and science and all this sort of thing. And at the same time, my grandma, who um, was a high school teacher in rural South Australia, she um, would always, on our school holidays, we'd go down there. So it'd take four and a half hours on the bus. Loves the, the sausage rolls. We always got a treat having sausage rolls when we're on the bus. Take the bus for like five hours to go see my grandma, grandparents. And she'd like, you know, at night times, I mean, the sky was amazing with the stars and everything. And she'd teach me all around astronomy and how stars were created and all these sorts of so things. So what age was that? Oh, this is from as early, like we would do that from like by ourselves maybe from age eight. Okay. Almost. But even before that, she was always like, we'd do all these little puzzles, these little maths quizzes, oh, yeah. logic problems. I loved it. And we'd like dissect a plant and she'd explain the anatomy of a plant and all these sorts of things. So she really sparked that interest in sciences with me. And her story is a little sad because she was amazing at science and maths and all this sort of stuff. And she actually studied physics at university um, way, way way back when, like in the 1920s kind of thing. She was one of only two women in the entire university studying physics. Um, and she wanted to become a physicist, but it was wartime. Her dad was a teacher. He said, it's a safe career. You're going to be a teacher. And she always, she has like regret from the fact that she was never able to sort of pursue that career. And I think she... Can you tell her that she's not the only one? Yeah. Uh, this story is very common, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And, but what was great is she did become a teacher and she has inspired and young girls. And, you know, she was my role model mm. for like... Um, and, yeah, we're going actually to her 90th next next year. Oh, my so God. She's still um, amazing and bright and all these things. So, yeah, she and my stepdad encouraged the skip year in school. She and my stepdad encouraged me. Like my stepdad, for example, has been Young Australian of the Year. So he's a 
very high achiever, incredibly Amazing. intelligent individual. What does he do? <laughs> He's in tech right now. He oh, works for, um, oh, I might not get this perfect, but he works for a company Brain called Brain Splat Podcast. And they are engineering ways to improve the um, success rate of, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, fertilization. Okay. Uh, well, that's a proper way of saying it. And they would be devastated that I can't articulate it rightly because I didn't intend to. But yeah, no, they're doing great things. They're making, they're using IoT. So he's a real, okay. So he's a scientist and no, he's in tech. Oh, and a... then his co founder is the scientist. And so together they've created this cool technology and they're using technology and um, like 3D printing to create these little tiny oh, yeah. makeshift embryos to or casings to house the embryos that increase the success rate of fertilization fascinating human he's a really smart interesting fascinating human. that's pretty good yeah so they're doing that um where was i so yeah yeah school went to school da, 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 ended up um at the end of year 12 got a scholarship to go study in japan for 12 months so i went over to japan uh when i was 17 studied at an international uni over there because i loved japanese um the culture and everything that was great huge learning experience came back and did information technology and telecommunications engineering degree and again oh. I didn't really know what I wanted back then smart kids did um uh medicine or law and I was like mm, neither of those so you didn't appealed. actually like medicine or law no neither of them appealed at all um and I'm like what else could I do and so the connection with my stepdad so let's step back one second here yeah. so during your school um, the way that I do, I do actually understand you now. Yeah, I've always been this uh, girl who focus on the study, and that comes with bullying or isolation, or was it? How, or did oh, you... well, it did a couple of things. So it's had a massive impact on my life, which I'll go into in a second. I was never bullied, or maybe a little bit because we were not particular. bullied as like whatever we know. It's yeah. bullying now, but more like isolated. Oh, yeah, she's a nerd, saying, and then let's yeah. leave her alone. A, a little bit of that it was kind of weird so there was a few things like I was a very inclusive human so at one of my high schools which was a co-ed one there were a couple of um boys who one was in a wheelchair and one was a dwarf and I was like they got bullied and left out and stuff and I would make friends with them and then people would give me a hard time for making friends with them but didn't really do much like that didn't bother me too much I was never really and I still am not a super social person like I feel very intimidated in social environments going to networking events I'm getting better because I've mm -hmm. done a lot of work on myself but certainly earlier on in my but career, being on a podcast is is fantastic so I think you're doing better than a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> trust me <laughs> oh I can talk about me forever yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, like, and in, in so networking events would make me feel very uncomfortable. And at school, I had maybe one or two friends, and they tended to be the the other kids Your, who were okay. like academic slash nerds as well. The so, smart people. Yeah, and then yeah. university changed because I was one of only maybe three girls doing technology or studying technology so out I of five hundred. So. Yeah, I became quite popular <laughs> in terms of like you know when you're one of three, all the guys want to talk to you. So, exactly. Um, that was that was always good fun. And I was always a little bit of a tomboy. Like I love to kick the footy. And when I say footy, I mean an AFL footy versus a New South Wales rugby footy. And we'd kick the footy on the street and whatever. So I was always comfortable with guys. And so moving into technology and doing university with just guys, the sports I did were martial just blended. Arts. It was just fine. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the shame with that, like sort of linking to that women in tech thing, the shame with that is that there's only a small percentage of women who are like that. And so for the other women entering a career in tech can be much more intimidating and much more like, hell, I don't want to hang out with a whole heap of blokes kind of, exactly. kind of thing. So I think that's one of the challenges that we, we have with the industry. But yeah, I was a little bit, a little bit of a loner. It didn't help that the scholarship that I got for high school, it was on the other side of town. So I had to catch a bus for like an hour and a half every morning to get to school and likewise to get home. So there was no sort of hanging out with friends after school. Um, most of the girls was a private school, were quite well off. Um, I wasn't, I used to hate casual days or mufti days because they'd all have their amazing clothes and I'd have my one billabong t-shirt that I'd bought with my pocket money that was two sizes too big, but it was on yeah. sale and that's why I got it. So I, you know, I, I, I did feel a little bit kind of isolated, but that was probably less. Because but that was a motivation for you too at yeah. the same time so yeah. to improve your life overall. Well, absolutely. I yeah. think I'm just motivated to solve problems and get things right and I'm a little bit competitive and that's probably what drove me. But mm. 
So you yeah. jumped to uni and yeah. uni. Yes. Yeah, so during university, I um, applied for a job at um, an internet cafe. Uh, which was a thing back then when there wasn't internet everywhere yeah. and help people understand what a browser was and stuff while I was studying. And then there were all these guys going upstairs. Um, and to the gaming there. room? or Well, no, no, it turns out that there was a data center up there because oh. my stepdad had helped me get the job in the internet cafe. I'm like, what are they doing? He's like, oh, we run a data center with what we're doing. And I'm like, can I tag along? And to be honest, initially he was a little bit resistant and not that keen or eager. And I think it was very much like... Like, you know, he didn't want to be seen as giving his daughter preference or a job where, you know, maybe it was or was not deserving. Um, but I hung around like a bad smell and tried to learn as much as I could. And they actually had the Microsoft Away team come because it was looking after the 9MSN website, which was a collaboration between Channel 9 and Microsoft. And their Away team came, which were the experts who were managing the data centers and getting things configured and optimized and scalable and all these things. And I hung around with them as well. And it was actually one of those guys who said, why haven't you hired her yet? Like, she's going to be brilliant. And that was what convinced my stepdad to actually hire me. And I started doing night shifts. So on Friday nights from 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. and Saturday nights from 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., I'd work night shift and then I'd go to uni during the day. And sometimes um, someone wouldn't show up for their Sunday night night shift and I'd gain an extra shift, which was great money, but would mean that I'd have to do a, like, full day of uni with no sleep and finishing with a three-hour physics prac in the afternoon it was tough but I learned so much and that actually led to me I was learning real technology that was being leveraged in the time in the day and then at university back then we we're getting taught really outdated stuff like the prime programming language was ADA we we're learning Fortran and just you know very outdated technology and so uh, when the opportunity came to there were the it. basics by the way there were like yeah, the like foundation of a lot of foundations yeah. but like for example if your primary programming language is ADA and in the industry the only people using ADA is the um, defense force yeah correct. that's not going to help you can you can teach the foundations of programming in C or Java or you know anything even just slightly more modern of that time and yeah. now you do I remember everything started in the defense force yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. And I think technology, you know, I think universities are probably like are getting better, but you know, there there's always a lag between industry 100%. and education. So, and that's one of the problems I'm trying to try So to solve. you started smelling the 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 money coming in. I took a, a I started working full-time there and I dropped out of or deferred. I don't know if I can go back to it 30 years, 25 years. I, mean, I deferred my I don't think that degree exists anymore, but I deferred my engineering degree and um started working full-time. Biggest and, mistake. No, it was great. No. No, I was earning more money than most graduates after But is it all about money? Well, I was learning real skills, applicable skills, mm. and earning great money and making great friends and getting into some really interesting areas in tech rather than learning the outdated stuff at the time of university. I would not advocate for others to do that today. That's what I'm saying. So that was my <laughs> no, next question. No, no, no. I mean, every situation is different, right? Like yeah. I got a really amazing opportunity. I fluked getting, or not fluked, through hard work and everything, but the the, the, the planets aligned and I was able to get that, that opportunity. Yeah. And for me, that was the right decision um and, and i think the time you were in was like the start of the peak yeah. of this idea yeah you're we talking about the late 90s yeah yeah um you know i worked the night shift of year 2000 that was triple pay oh. <laughs> you remember like we came from the background the y2k and, yeah and there was and the whole world will collapse <laughs> yeah, the only thing that broke so we were looking after all of my msn's infrastructure <laughs> And I think there was one thing that broke, and I think Maybe it was a countdown timer or something. Or timer, like or just or a clock in a on a PC somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so uni, and then you said, okay, that's enough for me, and suddenly you start jumping into the world of tech. The world of tech. Yeah, so I did. I stayed with that company, Brain Splat Podcast said, Company, for the first like for eleven years, and I went from being night shift operator to day shift operator to DBA, and um, I was an ads 
uh, platform subject matter expert. This was before Google and stuff, so it was an actual ads platform. Um, then I um, ran some pretty big projects, did reasonably well in those and became a technical project manager. And then I ran the technical projects implementation team. And then I took on all the technical um, senior engineers. They're a managed service provider, this yep. organization. Took on all the senior engineers. Um, I grew that and then I wanted to branch out a little bit. So I hired someone to replace me and then I went into some more strategic work and I worked on strategic projects with finance to work out the pricing model for our organization. I did big bids with government for um, work and so forth. And then I moved to Sydney because I got the opportunity to work with another pretty amazing individual called Klaus Bartosch. Um, and he was the sales director and he mentored me in sales. Mm. And so I ultimately discovered that sales is not for me because like the, I found it stressful versus invigorating to try and like win an account and go through It's a constant stress, it, correct? Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, having worked with so many salespeople since then, there are people that are built that get energy and, like, yes, drive out of ego, that. Whereas, yeah, exactly. for me, yeah. it sucks my energy. I learned the science very well. I studied the procedure behind sales and realized I could be quite good at it if I followed that, but it was just draining. So then the company got bought. And then I co-founded um, a cloud startup with Step That Again. And um, we um, basically built, uh, a ma- we we're trying to build a managed services platform and a managed services business for cloud back in 2009. So AWS wasn't even in Australia yet. Yep. And that was that was a tough slog because all of our bootstrapped initial investment got spent trying to explain to people what cloud was and exactly then it was a good thing and, and the so, reason to move to the cloud yes. which you still do until today exactly, exactly. and we're, what 15 years later 100 percent. so um it was it was really really tough. tough and we ended up getting to the point where we had to pivot because we needed to we weren't getting managed service customers because we do a pilot and people go oh just not yet um and all this kind of thing so we pivoted and did consulting and so that's when i met Probably, like, if you look at my life and the role models in my life, the first stage was my grandma. You know, she really got me into maths and science and all that. Then, you know, that next stage was my stepdad who really got me into um, technology. And then I did, I was the lead consultant driving our consulting for cloud for Coles Group. And there, the head of infrastructure and cloud and so forth was a woman named Debbie, Debbie Browning. And she was the next sort of role model for me. She um, she came from, she was less technical. She wasn't like uber technical. And she was, you know, I've always been tomboyish and she was definitely not tomboyish. And my initial perception was how can this person really be a leader in technology when they're not technical and they don't understand the geekiness of everything? And that's when I learned really big lessons around what makes a good leader. So what makes a good leader? Versus, yeah, exactly. So what, what does make a good leader? She she understood people and she understood, like, when I say she wasn't technical, I mean, she wasn't like super, uber geeky, do it hands on herself. She understood the strategy, the concepts, how things link together, the benefits of technology. She understood how to... Um, work with other departments and use her influence to um, drive outcomes. She knew how to build a team that respected her and um, enjoyed working for her. And it's so took- respect and joy. Yeah, yeah. And um, so it took me a little while. Like I got to work with her for a couple of years, and it, you know, I really had to kind of qu- go back and question my initial inaccurate judgments. And it taught me a good lesson around: hey, there's more to leadership. Because I was sort of, I'd been a manager and a bit of a leader, but I was always seen as like a, a strong leader. Um, you'd get good outcomes if you work with a forumer, but you'll work hard, she'll push you, all these kinds of things. Um, but I was starting to learn that there's more to leadership than just results. And and she certainly helped me learn that that lesson. So um, then, you know, I've been working with me for 17 years by that sort of time while I was at um, Virtual Arc and, and decided like I wanted to just see what I could achieve on my own. There was this imposter syndrome sitting in there going, well, um, maybe the only reason I'm successful is because I've been at the helm all the time and he's, you know, given me these opportunities. So you had your angel all the time watching you. Yeah. So that brought- do you consider yourself lucky in that sense? I do. 
like I look back at everything that's happened and you just learn so much from it. And I learned so much from working with, still learn obviously um, a lot from him today. And um, yeah, I think it was, it was really good, but I really wanted that opportunity to kind of just see what I could achieve without that influence um, directly. And so I applied for um, a role, uh, which turned out to be for Rackspace. And um, with his approval or without, uh, we discussed it. We discussed it. He wasn't, you know, super stoked about the concept of me leaving. Um, but uh, I'd also had my daughter at this time. Like, you know, it was tough doing the the consulting gig. And when my daughter was only four months old, I had to do um, consulting with Coles in Melbourne, and like it was. I remember crying at the airport where my flight coming back had been cancelled and it was the first time I'd been away from my daughter and just all the guilt of mother guilt emotions just like totally overpowering me and and feeling like I was the worst mother on the planet. And then then there were logistical challenges, like so I was breastfeeding and I had to pump and so I was like, hey, Coles, have you got a room where I can do this? And there was a time I left all my breast milk in the freezer and I had to call up and get like... Um, a pro- you know a male project manager to please go to the fridge and pour out all my breast milk and you know there's all these sort of like little micro challenges along with all the copious amounts of hormones and guilt and challenges that you're facing so um, you know that was tough and then you even you start to resent the job a little bit because you want to you want it's taking you away from your, your child um, so it took a while to sort of work through all of that and and I wanted a, a role where I could be a little bit more Sydney based and as I said sort of live on my own and that's where Rackspace came in. And okay before we go to Rackspace um, you mentioned a few things which really got my attention. One is the cloud mm-hmm. business which I'd love to have to your honest view on that because we all experience that. Mm. Um, do you think people here in Australia overall or around the globe, they would like to hold to whatever they have on premises versus letting go of whatever they think they have built over the years? Is it something that it's like, um, this is my baby and I just want to hold it There's rather than just... For, for that. It's called box hugging because like, a server is often referred yeah. to as a box and it's box hugging. We used to talk about it in managed services all the time, you know, because managed services like you built and you have your on-prem stuff and then managed services our job is to sort of go hey actually all we do is look after data centers so we can do it more optimally more efficiently more secure than you can in your own and then you can focus on your own stuff and so that was sort of the first test was trying to convince organizations to let someone else manage their environment then cloud comes along and it's not only that it's now going into this big corporations data center cloudy kind of space and they've got to um and you know it's you no longer have any control even over that infrastructure layer and so you saw a lot of people um resisting that as well or taking a long time to adopt adopt to that but the benefits of cloud are just so prolific like the scalability the the, the the ability to just leverage the rate of speed of innovation so the benefits of the cloud so prolific that um, people had to start taking notice, you know, the scalability, the security, the ability to, you know, relatively easy and easy is, as I said, a relative term, create um, microservices driven um, applications that are low cost, highly scalable, robust, all these things, Um, you know, you, you'll fall behind if you don't start to leverage some of this technology. Yes, there are organizations which are big enough to be able to create ecosystems that are cost efficient and so forth. But for the vast majority, cloud is a, a really good destination. So. Yeah, look, I, and I think the saving that you do at the cloud, especially like if you uncover all your unknown costs, mm. because you mainly focus on the tip of, of the iceberg, yeah. like in your, in your modeling. And then when you dig deep, within your business, you'll find, oh my God, I'm spending all of this money that I can save on the cloud. But it is an evolution of any business that I would just love to take yeah. through the journey. Absolutely. So, and yeah, like- and and then you have the cloud, cloud and then came whatever. We've been living in the cybersecurity threats 
which is nothing new, really. What is your point on cybersecurity these days, too? I don't know. I'm I'm far from a cybersecurity expert, yeah. but I've certainly, you know, filled out the uh, cybersecurity insurance surveys and made sure, yeah. like in my previous role, that we had a cybersecurity roadmap and so forth. And there's a, there's probably when it comes down to it, for most organisations, there's probably only two or three things that you just have to get right, and then the rest of it is, you know. Um, hit and miss as to whether it's, it's relevant or not. And, and those things are things like um, multi-factor authentication, making sure that all your systems are tied to multi-factor authentication because that's where the vast majority of attacks and breaches and all sorts of bits are going to come from. And I think that um, like the concept we always took at Rackspace was you shouldn't be thinking about how do I prevent an attack or a breach or whatever. It should be assume they're already in, and then how are you going to respond to that? Because there is no way, I mean, they're going to evolve it, it, it scams, hacking, whatever it is, it, it all evolves. And um, you just got to assume that you're going to, you're going to be hacked or whatever. And what is the way that you should then. Yeah. You, you, have, you always have to have, yeah, assume that you're going to be hacked yeah. regardless because, and hacking is not something new. No. So I'm not sure why this hype in the market now because hacking has always been done yeah um maybe at not not at the larger scale as it is now or people don't actually talk about it as much as they do talk about it now but it has been for many 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 years absolutely but i think it's because technology is more prolific because you've got um, so many more people participating in the technology game. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, yes, hacking was still happening, but not everybody's personal information was in all these different systems. Not as many people were using um, online payment systems and transactions and so forth. So I think it's it's gone from just being a threat to the organizations and their ecosystems to being a threat to the consumer and the individual as well. And the personal information. Exactly. Yeah. And that makes it interesting to the media. And when the media catches on to something, I mean, look at COVID, like when the media caught on to that, boom. I mean, we're, apparently right now there's a whole heap of COVID going on, but you don't see no anything. No one talks about no one it talks anymore. About it. Yeah. Um, it's when it, you know, when consumers are impacted by a breach, it's all over the news. But when there are other breaches that may not be as consumer driven, you, you don't hear as much about it. So I think they're the two things that kind of. And now at this moment, while we're recording, we're all living in the world of AI. Mm. Yeah, which is I uh, personally I found it really useful, fantastic. Um, it's a great tool. It speed up your process, the way you work. But what is your view on, on AI? AI? It's 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 a two edged sword, right? It's one of those. Um, I know that I saw this great talk at TEDx Sydney by I don't know her first name being Lee. She. Um, has run AI companies her entire uh, career and she talks about the ethics behind bringing up AI and making sure that, you know, the thing is it's it's really the person. It's the same as like a gun, right? A gun in itself can be dangerous or it can be protective, but if the person holding the gun has ill intent, it can cause harm. Yeah. And that's the same with AI. If the person behind it has ill intent or if the organization behind it is only focused on profitability and um, financial outcomes or whatever it might be that's their driver and not human outcomes and ethics driven outcomes, then you're going to end up with some really dangerous and scary outcomes and ones that you may not even notice. On the other hand, it is super helpful in the right hands doing the right thing. It can cause, it can create a whole heap of good. So I think the education needs to be around how should the AI use be used, and we need to make sure that we have very strict governing laws of. I think how that's AI what they started used. in Europe and and the states, just to regulate the exactly. usage of AI. But tell me something: would, Do you think AI would just make people smarter if someone is not smart? Uh, or it got a level of smartness to the point that they can use AI, would that accelerate their level of smartness and they will get bigger, get smarter and smarter over time? And I think intelligence is also innate. Like if you're an intelligent human being who can do X, Y, Z, but um, now you're an intelligent human being who can think of creative ways of using AI and achieve other things like... Um, I, I I think it, it it's a 
it's, I don't think it's going to make people smarter. If anything, it means that we rely too much on technology. I mean, look at people's ability to spell nowadays. Like it's reducing <laughs> considerably because no one I'll actually has to work it out. <laughs> it's all, all done by spell check and so forth. So it depends how I you... I can't even count. Yeah. <laughs> it depends how you measure, like by what degree you measure smartness. Is it problem solving? Is it your ability to solve problems? It might be, it might be really helpful for some people who are like really struggle with learning... Um, um, or with language and literacy, but are really intelligent, it might help them provide the literacy tools. I remember there was just the other week, I was running a workshop and a software engineer who used to work for me was helping with building out part of the the Tech Career Paths for Girls platform. And they um, we were using generative AI to create um, some parts of the workshop with script and so forth. So we were having a fake um, con artist talk about like you need to um, um, pay X amount of money to help your daughter or granddaughter who's in hospital kind of thing. And he created the script using chat GPT and then used um, another um, tool called Ella 11, Elevate 11, Elevate 11, which is a text to voice a generative AI platform. And he was able to create it beautifully so that it, a perfect English, all these sorts of things, and he's got English as a second language, and he's like, I love ChatGPT because I've always been able to code and do great, excellent coding, but I've had ch- ch- troubles with communication and so forth, and now I just use ChatGPT. Yeah, especially in engineering enhance... because really you don't use a lot of English. as yeah. well, You, you use... don't write essays. but Exactly. Yeah. And so he uses that to enhance his job ability. So you've got this super smart human who now can communicate better, which was holding him back previously. But what would uh, what would AI do to Emma if we go back, I don't know, like years back, and Emma, this young girl, who was really extremely smart, getting all these um, awards in school and AI came in, uh, where would Emma see herself now if she had this tool back 20 years ago or whatever? Well, that's an interesting question. Exactly. Well, it, it is, you, you may not have the answer now. No, I don't. I but don't it that is that. something that if we look back and say, okay, um, all the stress or the struggle, then the amount of time that we went just to find the information during our early days of study where we used to go to the library and do the research and do everything ourselves. What if we had this additional... Yeah. Well, it already, like, you already see that. So, like, back when I was at high school, there was no internet, right? It just started yeah. being a thing. It was dial-up, slow on phone, no one was on there, like, very little information. And so I'm of the era of the old school, yeah, library and encyclopedias and books and all this sort of stuff to get information. And then, you know, now we're in the era, my daughter's at school and you're in the era of internet and you can you just – ask Google a question and out comes the answer kind of thing. So, um, and yet I still see the principles, the underlying principles that still rely are the ability to problem solve and use your brain to depict logic and come up with solutions and so forth. And the internet couldn't do that for you. It could give you various outcomes and who's done what before and that sort of thing, but it couldn't do that piece for you. Generative AI starts to take a bit of a step in that direction, but it's still all based on the foundation of what's already happened. Correct. So when you're talking about problems to solve in the future, when you're talking about um, things that haven't been written or said before, you're talking about innovation and new stuff, it's not going to be able to provide those answers to students. So our education system needs to sort of evolve. Imagine if it does, you would be billionaires. Everyone will be, because but, you know, you would know the answer for the future. Yeah, but you can't be a billionaire exactly. if everyone has access to the technology. 100%. It's a level playing field. Um, so again, like if everyone has access to it, then... The people, it's still what you do with it, the motivation drive and whatever you have behind it. Because let's say you've got a kid that's not motivated, doesn't study, never did the research. They're still going to like just put stuff into chat TPT. It's going to come out. I can, a lot of the time I can detect already, like if someone's used chat TPT because chat TPT has a style. Yeah. Um, and, you know, whereas the student who's coming up with their own ideas and whatever and, and, that sort of thing is going to stand out again because everybody else is using chat GPT. So I still think it's the same. It's just leveling up each 
each time. Yeah, I, I think, think I think time would tell. Yeah. How how the market will adjust and absorb this movement now. In our preliminary interview, you told me is you mentioned something really important for me um, is happiness. Obviously, you went through this path. You start from somewhere. You did your level. You're high up, and you didn't find yourself happy. It's not an achievement. Yeah. And then you decided to do something different. Yep. Tell us about this different stuff that you're doing now. Okay, so I'll I'll talk a little bit about tech career paths for girls. So basically, to what you said, I found that like, and from that very early age, where I was, as I said, a nerd, I'd study my butt off. Um, had this very high level of drive and push myself to the limits and and always trying to prove myself. And I did that throughout my career. It served me well from the perspective of advancing my career, uh, getting more senior positions, uh, more money, all those wonderful things. Um, But as I accumulated seniority, I also gained responsibilities in my life, a partner, children, um, and your perspective on life kind of changes. And so what I found was the more senior I got, the less fun the work was. Um, and then when you go, okay, so what is the purpose behind what I'm doing? If it's not, if I've got more stress and I'm not doing as many of the fun things, then what is it that's driving the underlying purpose? And more often than not, when you turn around and you look at what's driving all the decisions being made, your shareholder return. Correct. And that's just not inspiring. It does. I think you reach a point or not everybody, but I certainly reached a point where it was like, I want to do something that's meaningful. Um, and I don't want it to be purely financially driven and so uh when I had the opportunity to take a break I kind of had a bit of a pet project that I've always been um um, an advocate for gender diversity in tech I've been on panels and all that sort of thing but found it was like limited in the tangibility like you'd speak to to a group or on a panel and people would come up afterwards and say they were inspired and all these types of things but it wasn't you know they'd go away maybe an hour later and not um, not remember or a week later, you know, it, it had a lifespan on it and I wanted to do something more tangible. And so when I had a break, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to build out this little idea that I've had, which was to build out a platform that young girls could leverage to sort of give them the exposure or explain the different diversity, diversity of roles within technology, because everyone has this kind of stereotype in their mind that it's all just about coding solitary coding um and i wanted to to showcase the diversity of opportunities in tech and so i built this little it's a like a choose your own adventure it's a build your own tech adventure um platform where you start you hsc and you get your results and then you can pick what degree you're going to do and then you drive this journey where you're making decisions what projects are you going to do what companies are you going to work for what disciplines are you going to go down and um, tested it out on my daughter and she loved it and I went okay that's pretty promising how about I expand my testing circle here and I'll test it out on some of her friends so they came over during the school holidays played with the platform loved it so I went okay let's test this out at, at a school and so I did it for all the year five and sixes at my daughter's school and like I'm a data-driven person so survey before survey after and we saw like some amazing um, transformations in that we saw that Of the entire class, over 62% were more likely to consider a career in technology afterwards. And when you consider that's reflecting the human population, that's pretty good. We saw that the number of, or the percentage of girls who scored a likelihood of eight, and that's the highest it was, eight before the session was 5%. And after the session was 21% with eights, nines, and tens. That's pretty good amazing and you'd have really good feel-good moments as well so I also ask when you think of a career in technology what comes to mind and I ask it before and after and before one young girl put I imagine I would not be good at it and then after she wrote I think I would be good at it you know we've just changed that whole young girl's perception of her not only the technology industry but her skills and confidence to capabilities capabilities Um, And then one girl wrote uh, computer games. Beforehand, what comes to mind? Computer games. And then after the session, she had capitalised the world. And, like, those sorts of things gave me the the feeling that maybe I can do more with this. Maybe it's not just a little thing I do as a hobby. And that's when I created Tech Career Paths for Girls as as a business to inspire young girls into vibrant 
uh, diverse careers. You know, the program, the innovative program, utilizes storytelling, adventure, and um, hands-on experiences to show girls the exciting possibilities within yeah. tech. Uh, and uh, it breaks stereotypes and makes tech relatable and engaging. So I then built some workshops as well, which I uh, created this character called Snow Leopard. Uh, she came out of my daughter loving um, Black Widow from the Avengers. Mm-hmm. And um, Snow Leopard by day, she's Shelley Baker, a tech genius data scientist for a med tech firm. And by night, she's Shelley Baker, cyber um, superhero mystery solver. And yes, yeah, so I, I built these workshops where girls have to solve a mystery. Yeah. And I call it like the bolognese strategy because I'm hiding all these tech activities inside this mystery in the same way parents hide vegetables inside the bolognese sauce. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they're just the girls more fun than the platform, which is sort of more about bringing awareness. This was about showcasing there's more to technology than just tech, than just coding. So it's like you, it's it's about um, the workshop leverages data management, it leverages AI image classification, a few other different um, technical aspects. Um, and then I've got an AI one that I'm building now, which is going to be so fun as well. So right now, uh, when you look at that, even if it does get a bit stressful and, and that sort of thing, there's a real purpose behind it. I can feel whole in the sense that, um, I'm helping and by being my own organization, my own company, I can dictate the hours that I work and I've gained a much better balance in my life and better relationships with my kids. I'm a geeky track all the things about myself person. There's a statistic called HRV, which is your heart rate variant. Mm -hmm. And the higher that is, um, it reflects a positive, um, an increase in health. And I've increased since starting my own business and getting out of the tech corporate world. Um, my HRV has gone up about 8%, which is a massive jump in HRV. It's fantastic. So, you know, I've got the, I can show that my heart rate, my resting heart rate has gone down from an average of like 55, 54 during night down to like 47 beats per minute. So there's all these real physical indicators that what I'm doing is good for me physically um, and mentally, I feel a lot happier working for something that is purpose driven. That's my own agenda, my own time frames, and um, although obviously commercials are important, I need to. You know, we're going to be commercializing the program in schools next year. Um, I'm very much trying to keep away from that. Finance is a sole driver. My sole driver is positively impacting girls and making sure that I'm happy and enjoying my life. Yep. Yeah. Look, uh, I think whatever you're doing is really great uh, because I think we both started in, in an industry that we knew little about. Mm-hmm. So I can talk about my personal experience. Um, you had uh, or you still have a guardian angel who guided you all along the way. A mm-hmm. uh, few people do have this luxury, but now it is something really great. And I think it would give the new, the, the new generation an opportunity to understand what is tech in general. But you as a woman, you did struggle to an extent being in the tech industry. Um, are you teaching this to the young girls that you should expect this as part of the package? So I have a theory that I won't know if it's true until um, we're successful in changing the gender diversity in tech. My theory is that one of the reasons that it is so challenging as a woman in tech is because there are so few of us and that the men in tech are used to being having a very masculine um, industry. They're used to working with other men um, and the women uh, spend a lot of their try- time either trying to emulate masculine characteristics or f- try and be themselves and that consumes a lot of energy as well. Um So my theory is that if we can get to a tipping point with the number of women in the tech industry, then the whole culture of the industry will start to shift. And as well as that, so my program, which I'm obviously running for young girls, I also run for young boys because my view is like in the platform, there's all these role model videos. There's women come in and talk about their experiences in tech before the the hands-on workshops. Um, The characters in the story are female. 
that's subtly influencing the next generation of men or boys who become the next generation of men in tech to understand a more inclusive, a more balanced kind of, of way. So my theory, which I am hoping and ethically really want to be true, is that it is tough being a female in tech, but one of the reasons is because we're a minority and that if we can change that balance, then it will become less tough and more appreciative and understanding and ability to um, be more natural. That's my theory, right? But it's it's nothing that you can... Look, it's, it's not going to be easy, but at no. least you start from somewhere and seriously, you're doing something really great. A person, I really appreciate what you, whatever you're doing. Uh, it is an opportunity for a lot of this new generation to understand that there is a field out there um, that comes with a bit of pain, mm -hmm. like everything else, but it is very rewarding too at the same time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like, there are challenges which I have no idea how we're going to overcome. Like, women, when they go on maternity leave, they tend to go on maternity leave longer and they take a career um, um, hit. Yep. And and I don't know how we overcome that. Like yep. that's 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 something I don't have an answer to. But if you've got more women in tech, then it becomes a bigger problem that people take more notice of, and will get more smart smarter people than me focusing on and coming up with a solution. Whereas if it's only affecting the minority, then there are less people who care that much. Hundred um, percent. So hundred you know, percent. There's problems, but I'm just hoping that if we can shift that balance then those problems become bubble up to the surface. They become more important because they're hitting more of a majority than a minority. And then there'll be groups attempting to solve them with real energy and so forth. So am I, obviously you're married, you've got kids, um, you have a husband that I haven't met. So hopefully one day I will meet him. Um, has he been supportive through all this career transition? Yeah. No, he's been, he's been pretty amazing. So there's times I think you take your partner because you see them every day a little bit for granted sometimes. Yeah. And there's, but there's, there's moments, there's little moments that I have in my mind which I go back to sometimes and make me smile and feel all wonderful on the inside. The most recent one was um, when I finished up my corporate, most recent corporate role. It was, it was a tough finish. Like it was a very difficult ending because I was so at a, such a high stress level and all these things. Yep. And my husband sat down and said, Emma, congratulations. How are we going to celebrate? How are we going to celebrate me getting my wife back, our kids having That's fantastic. A, a, a mother again, you being happy. Maybe you can start your martial arts again and get back into that sort of thing. Cause I was so stressed that every time I attempted to get fit, I'd have a cold. So I'd try any exercise and I'd get a cold. Um, you know, I was grumpy with the kids and he was just like, we want Emma buddy. back. We yeah, want, we want Emma, Emma back. back. And it's like, he's, he's not like financially driven. He's like, we've got a lovely house, but we don't need one this big. We da, 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 da. Like all these things like Emma, I just want us to be a happy unit. And, um, you know, that I shouldn't need it, but that permission to say, okay, I don't have to engage or be in this corporate world anymore and drive this amazing career and titles and money and whatever i have permission by the people i love the most to just be me that's fantastic like, that was amazing so you know he is a very very different human to me and he brings me the balance that is needed to be able to for me to be happy and Help. But definitely you needed a partner through all this time that is does really understand. He was a stay-at-home dad. Yeah, 100%. You know, without him being a stay-at-home dad, I couldn't have done You couldn't have dream. done it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And this is what new generation need to understand that, especially women mm. or girls who would love to go into this industry. They need to understand that they need support. Yeah. They can't do it on their own. It's really hard. And, it's really tough. And it's okay to be driven and want to have a career and not, just like there's a lot of guilt with oh maybe I'm a bad person because I don't want to spend all my time with my children but it's just different people are made differently and like my family is more important than my career but if I didn't have my career I wouldn't feel fulfilled yeah. in the same way that if I didn't have my family I'd feel wouldn't feel fulfilled one is slightly above the other family above work but that doesn't mean 
that I need to forego work. And if I did, as I said, my but if I did ask you this question 20 years ago, would you, would you say oh, no. family is over? No, no, no. no, no. How, I'm just trying to work out how old I was 20 <laughs> years ago. Up until my late 20s, yeah. I wasn't going to have a family. Yeah. Because my it's all about I your loved, profession and yeah, well, I love the relationship I had with my mum, right? Yeah. And I said to myself, um, if I can't be a stay-at-home mum and give my kids the attention that they need, I don't think it's fair to have children. I don't want them to. But then I evolved to thinking, well, hang on, that love and attention doesn't have to just come from me. It can also come from my partner. Um, and Nick, um, my husband, was like totally happy about and excited even about the prospect of being a, a stay-at-home dad. So it, it worked. Yeah. Fantastic. And, um, yeah. Look, Emma, and today uh, you, you hardly can do anything without social media. Hmm. Do you follow social media? Are you active in this field? <laughs> I'm active How are you promoting your business if you're not yeah. doing social media? Okay. And... So I do social media for my business. Yeah. I don't do social media personally. Why is that? Uh, because there was one night that I was sitting on the sofa. My husband was sitting on the other edge of the sofa and we were both looking down and just scrolling through Facebook. And I'm like, what? Why am I? Like my human husband is sitting right there and yet I'm interacting and looking at these people on Facebook who I haven't seen for years. This is not a good behavior. This is not good for my soul. It is not good for human connection. And I deleted Facebook as an app and I got rid of all the bits and pieces that I did associated with that and created rules for myself or guidelines for myself as to how I wanted to be interacting as a human because I believe social media can be quite addictive and it can remove us from the the real life that is right in front of us. So I use Even it, as adults. Even as adults. Yeah. Even so imagine like the impact on the kids. Who've seen it. That my daughter doesn't she's twelve, she doesn't have a phone. Um she's going to high school next year. We'll probably will get her one, but it'll be so strict strict around the rules of you come home it goes in the box over there you're not yeah we'll see how long it's gonna last (laughs) you know like it's our first foray into that space that's how we all started yeah yeah so it's how we're gonna make the rules we're gonna make the boundaries so deliberate and yeah and you have to be agreed to it as well like um yeah so i i use it for my business i um i'm not particularly great at it but it's a it's a necessary i don't want to call it evil but it's a necessary tool for operating in any business today yeah 100% look uh, personally i use every single medium and um i don't have anything to hide i'd like to share every single moment of my life with everyone around the globe i've got no issue with that but this is a personal choice yeah yeah so um, um and it people, becomes very yeah, different. People, yeah, see it from a different perspective, but obviously yeah. this is all fair. It becomes very different when you start talking about children, though, yeah. because, like, the AI technology and deep fake capabilities that exist today, you just need a few photos, maybe some video footage, and they can age that person. They can emulate your voice. They can emulate, um, you know, you can end up falsifying videos and all sorts of things. So it's a very... Again, yeah, but you know, what do you do? Do you li- do you box yourself and live in fear that someone would just steal your ID and or you just take it out as as it is and you balance it? Yeah, I think you educate on it. So, like, you educate your kids. Like, you know, there's a pro and con about using social media. Here's and you you explain the sorts of things that can happen as part of that, and you might even talk about how can we avoid or how can we respond in these situations. But it's not just going in and going, ha ha, you know, I'm doing all the things. There's no guidelines, there's no boundaries, and there's no thought behind it. Because I think by the way, schools are doing a really good job these days. Um, they they are raising awareness for the kids. Yes, and I'm seeing in my, in my kids' school, which are really really doing a great job in that. Mm, yeah, but we have to chase them on a day-to-day basis too. We have to keep an eye on everything, as you said, um, Emma. One of the most important person that you've mentioned many, many times uh, that was your grandma too, mm. and your grandma is someone I would love to know more about because obviously she has impacted you. Mm. Profoundly. I want to know <laughs> everything about this lady because obviously she had a dream that she didn't follow up on her dream. Yeah. And she saw you, she spotted you, saw your potential, and she guided you 
Um, what would you like to say to this woman? Oh, and, and I, I think I have seen it. She had an accident, um, I don't know how many years ago now. Let's, let's call it five or six years ago now. And she, um, a very bad car accident. And I went to see her in hospital. And I think at that time I sort of had built a level of awareness of the influences that people had had on my life. And I explained to her that, you know, she was a massive role model for me as a kid. And she was one of the reasons that I got into technology. And, and I make a call out to her whenever I'm on a podcast or I'm writing an article or talking about these things, because I think it's really important. One of the things I do believe is that there's a lack of, one of the reasons girls aren't in technology, for example, is because there's a lack of female role models. And if you aren't lucky enough to have someone like that in your life, where do you, where do you get that nudge or that push or that awareness? Um, so yeah, I've, I've, I've told her that, um, a few times, like how much she's been an influence and a role model in my life. And she's an incredible, like she's, she's in almost 90 and she's still doing the papers and bits and pieces for government grants for the museum that she runs in the rural South Australia. She is still, you know, they're still both my grandma and my grandpa who's like in his mid nineties living independently on a farm, like 30 minutes from the closest town. Um, I think they're incredible humans and, um, she got me into all sorts of things. Like she got me into science fantasy or, or fantasy, science fiction and fantasy books. Um, she is just like, and that's one of my favorite sort of pastimes is, is, is reading fantasy to escape my, my real world when, especially when it was in corporate world and stressful. Uh, so, you know, she's a very, very capable very smart human being who has a very special part in my upbringing in life I became a teacher and then she was the actual I don't know if she was only the deputy or became the principal of the rural high school as well so even within her ecosystem that was you know the path that she ended up sort of being guided pushed yep. down she excelled within the realm of which she could this is your excelled. camera just say something oh, to her Say something to grandma. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, give it a good go. That feels really awkward and weird. That's good. <laughs> um, and no, uh, thank you, grandma, for being such a positive influence on my life, helping me get into the field that I'm in and being an incredible role model and showing me um, how capable we can be as women in these in sciences and technology and in male, traditionally male-dominated fields. Fantastic. <laughs> Look, before we wrap up, uh, Emma, what is your message really to the, the, to the young generation now? Yeah. Um, what is your advice? So what have you learned so my far? My very yeah. personal advice, it's, it may not relate to everybody, but for those who are similar, it, hopefully it will. I pushed myself and had incredible drive and ambition and worked incredible hours and put incredible amount of pressure on myself to succeed and prove myself. And ultimately it resulted in me spending many, many years not particularly healthy, especially as I aged, not particularly healthy and not particularly happy. Uh, and... I would, if I could go back in time, I believe that it, everything I've done has driven me to my place that I am now and I don't regret anything. But if I was doing over, um, I think I'd take things just a little bit slower and a little bit easier and enjoy, you know, everyone talks about smelling the roses along the way, like actually going, you know, what the amazing career, financial reward, it's not as when you get further up and once you get there it's not as important as you really make it out to be when you're younger uh so I would say if you're that high achiever who's pushing yourself to your limits all the time it has a toll and as you get older let's say you're female and you have kids um that toll becomes more and more profound and it has an impact on your ability to be happy so that would probably be my advice keep an awareness of that don't push yourself because it's ultimately not worth it in the end fantastic emma thank you so much it was a pleasure. pleasure having you on board and all the best in your new venture um, you. i'm sure you would do great you do fantastic actually let's hope so
and have as much of an impact on those girls as we possibly can. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Absolutely. Happiness is indeed a powerful motivator and the journey towards it often brings valuable experiences and personal growth. Even when the destination is not always reached, the lessons learned along the way contribute to a fulfilling life. Until next time, stay safe. Yeah, look, I was, I didn't really know what to expect coming into it. Uh, based on our interview, it, it felt like it, it was a little bit about technology and my expertise in that space, but also then very much about like um, me as a human and my life experiences. So it was a little bit, I came in with an open mind, but not entirely sure what to expect. And um, I had a great time. So I, I quite enjoy being peppered with questions. I particularly like questions which are a little bit challenging and make you think because, I don't know, there's something fun inside me that likes to, to do that sort of thing. And there were a number of those throughout the session, so that was enjoyable. Um, I, I think there's some telling stories and humanizing, you know, people in tech and in particular people who have already built their career in tech so that they don't appear as these, like, Robots. Robots who had the perfect life, who, you know, always had success and got everything right. Um, I think it's really important to humanize uh, so that people can see themselves in others and go, oh, yeah, I screwed that up too. And, oh, yeah, I've done, had those issues as well. And so that people can see themselves and go, oh, I can, I can achieve whatever it might be that I want to achieve. So